Hello and welcome to today's webinar, the first of 2018, which is looking at the 2017 Annual Information Statement. I'm giving you a hand um, getting through the form. My name is Matt Crichton and joining me today to present the webinar is, as it says on your screen, Chris Richards. Hello, Chris. Hello. Hi, everyone. We're both from the education team here at the ACNC and we hope we can um, provide you with a useful webinar today. Just before we do get into the content proper, um, there's a couple of just admin things we need to clear up. If you have any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. When you signed up, you should have received um, some details about um, the phone number you can call to, to tune into the audio via your phone will give you an access code, that sort of thing. So if you're having troubles with audio, um, try dialing that number. It generally works and clears up any problems. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, um, don't hesitate to answer, uh, ask them as we go. We're um, happy to answer them as we go along. We've got a couple of colleagues standing by waiting to answer your questions, Madison and Tim. They'll do their very best to get to all your questions. But of course, depending on the, the volume that they're faced with, we might not be able to get to all of them during today's webinar. In the case that we don't, whatever remaining question, remaining unanswered questions, we will get to um, via email later on. So you, your question will not remain unanswered. We can assure you of that. And um, we'll have a, uh, some time for a Q&A session at the end. So if you prefer to watch the formal presentation and then ask some questions following it, that's fine too. You don't, you don't have to um, send your questions as we're doing the formal presentation, you can wait for the Q&A session. And we'll choose a few questions that pop up then and, and I'll answer them um, for you live. And again, if we don't get to all your questions, we will endeavour to do so later. And um, finally, we are recording today's webinar, as we do with all our webinars. So if you do happen to miss something or your internet drops out or you get called away for something important, um, don't worry, you can go onto our website in a couple of days and, and you'll find a recording of it, which will sit on the website forever. So if you want to come back to it at any, at any time, you can do so. Which also means that throughout the webinar, you don't have to frantically scribble down every single reference to every uh, link and, and piece of information. Of, of course, you can if you'd like to, but just know that it will be recorded. And we will send a an email, um, a follow-up email with all the references and, and um, links and information that you need um, following the webinar in, in the next couple of days. Okay. That's all the admin stuff out the way. We will get to the presentation proper now and um, hopefully provide you with some much needed help for the 2007 annual information statement and still um, give you enough time to get to your lunch once we're done. All right, I will pass on to Chris now who will take you over what we'll cover today. Um, yeah, look, today's webinar is uh, aiming to help charities who are looking to fill in their 2017 annual information statement, um, either for the first time or people or charities who've done it previously. We've got a little bit of information for everyone today. Um, we've got uh, quite a number of charities uh, who have a reporting period, um, which is aligned with a regular financial year. That's uh, July 1 to June 30. Um, they would probably be working through their annual information statements right now because they have a due date of uh, 31 January. Um, so that's why we're having this webinar right now. Um, what we're going to cover, let's see, we'll, uh, we're going to provide some background on what the annual information statement is. We'll uh, highlight our annual information statement hub uh, as well as the, uh, the extra uh, support materials we've got available to help you complete the form. Uh, we're going to run through uh, some of the other information and documents and material you're going to need to help uh, to complete your statement. Uh, now, the bulk of the webinar, once we get through all those bits and pieces, will be an overview of each of the state uh, each of the sections uh, in the uh, in the statement. Um, we'll look to provide some info, some screenshots, and some advice on on how to fill out the form. Uh, we're going to have a 
particular focus on some of the new sections of the form, as well as sections which have tripped charities up in the past. Uh, one of those would be perhaps the financial section. Um, there's also uh, a couple of questions in the activities section, which uh, sometimes trip trip charities up, so we'll aim to help there. We'll also provide a quick reminder about what can happen if your charity fails to submit its uh, annual information statement. And look, it's probably not a good thing. That's your that's your spoiler. Okay, so let's jump in without, without further ado. Okay, um, Chris mentioned the hub, the annual information statement hub. It's a, just a spot on our website that has lots of information to help you through the annual information statement. And you can find it as the URL says there on the screen at acnc.gov.au forward slash 2017 AIS. That contains a guide, which is a really handy document to download and print out or just have it handy when you're completing the form because it takes you through in great detail um, all the questions contained within the form. The checklist and preventing mistakes guide is a really good one as well. Um, we've taken the lessons we've learned and charities have learned over the past few years and come up with some useful tips to help them avoid some common errors that we've seen in, in previous years. So definitely have a look at those um, resources. And we've also got video guides. Now these are little short uh, videos that cover each section of the form. So if you're um, more inclined to, to watch and learn from a, a short minute or so video than you are from reading um, lots of text in a guide, um, by all means, have a look at those videos. They will help you answer each section of the AIS. Okay. And, of course, when you're in the form, which you can't see on the screen now, but once you're logged in and you're doing the form, the help text for each question is also has been improved this year and, and should um, provide you with lots of guidance, um, failing access to these resources. Chris, what's the annual information statement? Okay, dokes. Uh, look, it's... This is pretty much, I guess, information for people who may not have filled this one in before, but um, it's an online form which all registered charities need to complete each year or each reporting period, uh, unless you're a group which has an, a, a, like an exemption. Um, we'll cover that in a little bit more detail later on. The form asks a series of questions, and they're both uh, financial and non-financial questions. The financial questions look at things like um, charity revenue, expenses, um, income funding sources, uh, that sort of stuff. Non-financial questions, they cover um, uh, like a number of other aspects of charity work, uh, some of which you can see on the slide there. Um, their activities, um, who charities help, um, staff and volunteer numbers, reporting board committee members, who we call responsible persons, uh, that sort of thing. Now, the information we get that informs the ACNC's work uh, to ensure charities are complying with their obligations and doing the right thing. It's also used uh, in some other ways, uh, one of which is to compile studies like our, uh, our annual Australian Charities Report. Uh, it's also help, helps streamline reporting to uh, various state, territory and federal regulators. Um, one of the aims of, of the ACNC Act, one of the objects of the ACNC Act is to cut down on duplicate reporting and red tape. So that's that's a key, uh, a key part of uh, why we're asking some of these questions. As you can see here, uh, the annual information statement, uh, the due dates vary but the form must be submitted within six months of the end of the charity's reporting period. Now, the two most common deadlines are June 30 and December 31. Now, we, we mentioned December 31, but uh, for anyone whose annual information statement was due on December 31, there is a one-month extension in place, and that sees the deadline shift to January 31 which is uh, obviously right around the corner. You can check your charity's annual information statement deadline by visiting uh, your entry or your charity's entry on the charity register. That's uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash charity register. A full rundown of annual information statement due dates can also be found on the ACNC website, and that's at acnc.gov.au forward slash reporting due dates. The short answer to the reporting due dates if you didn't get a chance to go over all of the guidance on the website is that you look at the the period to which your charity keeps its um, information, its finances and whatnot, keeps its records in its books. Um, 
whatever that may be. And as the screen says, it could be the calendar year, could be the financial year, but whatever that is, the due date for the AIS is six months following the end of that particular reporting period. Um, but as Chris said, lots of information on the website to help you out with that. Accessing um, the annual information statement is really easy. Um, you can see a, a screenshot of our homepage there on your screen at the moment, and it's highlighting two options. One, in the top right hand corner is the charity portal. Click on that. That'll take you to a spot to log in using your charity's um, unique user credentials, and then you can access the annual information statement there or via the um, other link there, submit the AIS um, and the AIS hub that we mentioned yes. a couple of slides yes. ago, which has lots of support materials here. So there's plenty of ways to get to the AIS. The most important thing is that you'll need your username. Uh, generally, that's the ABN. Actually, not generally. In all cases, yes. it's the ABN. <laughs> and the password, which as a responsible person for a charity should have handy. Now, um, once you get into the the form, uh, there's an introductory page. Uh, now that goes through um, just some, I guess, final instructions before liftoff. Uh, and some of them just remind you of some of the material you should have at hand uh, to help complete your charity statement. Um, we've got a list of those, those bits and pieces on the slide there, which we've also already mentioned. Um, you, this year, Charities, importantly, have the ability to save their form as they go. Um, now, we recommend you save frequently. Um, and if you save and exit the form, you can pick up uh, when you return, you can pick up where you, uh, where you left off. Um, charities can also preview their annual information statement before they submit it this year. Um, this allows charities to, to double check their responses before they submit their statement. And one thing that we've, uh, we've taken note of and, and uh, one thing that the preview sort of uh, function will help with is that a number of people who fill out this, uh, this form on behalf of their charity like to check with perhaps, um, you know, their, their, their treasurer, some office bearers, just to make sure that their details in the uh, in the form are correct. Um, so what this will do is it'll allow you to preview it, print it, and do exactly that. Uh, now the final point before we get into the form itself, we would ask uh, charities to please be patient when working through the form. There are times where it will need to refresh and it will need to load new information or new questions depending on the responses you provide. This doesn't happen instantaneously. Um, a loading message will appear on screen uh, when the form is refreshing or when new information is being uh, loaded up. Um, the web browser you're using um, will clearly display when the form is refreshing and, and loading. Well, be, be patient, please. Uh, wait, wait for these processes to finish before continuing with the form. We do apologise in advance if the form is a little slow in loading. Um, it often ends up like that when there is heavy traffic uh, from high numbers of people accessing the form. It can slow things down a touch. The good news is that we're working through the processes pretty much right now of significantly upgrading our, our systems, and this is going to include the annual information statement form. That will make accessing and completing the form far quicker and far easier in the future. Okay, thanks for that, Chris. On to the form now. Uh, actually, just before we move on, some of these things that we've got on the screen here, they will help you fill in the AS, but they might not necessarily be needed to get through it for some charities. Mm. It depends on the, the nature of the charity, the size of the charity. But um, for example, don't panic if you don't have your PAYG payment summaries handy. You may still be able to get through the yeah. form with other details that your charity has on hand. Section A, basic charity information. Um, this really shouldn't require too much information on hand. It's name, contact information and size of the charity. Size is an interesting one. Um, just make sure you are aware of the, the charity sizes. It, it is small, medium and large with the ACNC, which is designated by um, revenue uh, boundaries. We'll get onto that in a little bit. Mm. Um, Many of the questions will be pre-filled with answers from your previous online AIS submission, and that speeds things up a little bit. And just, um, yeah, make sure you double check that the charity size is correct, because that does affect the uh, later stages of the form. It will change some of the questions that you have to um, answer later on. And of course, if you make a mistake, that is alerted to us later on. You have to we'll get in touch with you to have you correct it anyway. So it's a good thing to get it done correctly at the beginning. How about section B? 
Uh, now, that looks at activities, as it says there. Now, that's uh, questions about your charity's work. Um, first question you'll be asked is uh, if your charity actually conducted any activities during the, the reporting period. Now, uh, we often remind charities that when we speak about activities, they can be financial or non-financial. Now, we don't look at activities as just those sort of traditional tangible things, um, you know, running a service for homeless people, uh, overseas aid work, that sort of stuff. Of course, these types of charitable work in the field or, or on the street are, you know, classed as activities, but the ACNC also classes other work as activities as well. Um, strategic planning, which charities should be doing, uh, undertaking administrative work, uh, even just employing staff, they're all activities as well. Uh, they're all important as well. Now, the aim of the question is to identify inactive charities. For all of you with us today, it's highly unlikely your charity will be inactive. So answering yes to this question is most likely the way to go. If you do answer no, you'll be asked to explain why your charity didn't conduct activities in, in the re most recent reporting period. Yep. And that third point there is probably a good rule of thumb. If you're unsure, it's likely that it's yes, yeah. because yeah. no would imply that your charity is no longer running. Um, so... As Chris mentioned, activities goes beyond that which you would ordinarily think of classic activities. Yeah. Um, section B, activities specifically and some of the beneficiaries is a question that has tripped up some um, people in the past. It asks about the activities during the 2017 reporting period. Again, reporting period is that period to which your charity reports its finances and its activities. Um, as you can see, you can choose your charity's main activity from a, um, a drop-down list there. This is a screenshot from the actual form itself, by the way, that you can see on your screen now. And um, choose, choose the one category that best suits your charity's main activity. And we understand that many charities may have multiple um, main activities, which is where the next part of the question comes in. If your charity does have more than one main activity, you can select from the list below. You can see the first part uh, on your screen, but yes. the main activity there is is to choose one main one, more, more than others. Yeah. We understand that that doesn't lock you in to, to that activity solely, but it does require you to make a judgment on the part of the charity um, that you're filling this form in for. Okay. <clears throat> The rest of the questions um, in Section B activities will ask you about where the, um, uh, the charity has conducted its activities, locations, describe how the charity's um, activities and outcomes have helped achieve the purpose of the charity. Your annual report will, be, will often um, contain a great rundown of something like this that you can use to respond here. And it asks you to state who the charity's beneficiaries are. Now, these are the, these are the people that the charity helps, the, the ones that it's set up to help. Um, you can see there on the screen, question 11 says, who were your charity's main beneficiaries in the 2017 reporting period? When thinking about beneficiaries, um, many charities will know they, they do help a wide cross-section of the community, not a specific group in particular. And if that's the case or or if it's focused on the environment or animals, select select general community in Australia option as as your response. If it's not covered by a specific um, a specific group listed within the drop down menu, we've got uh, we're under section section C now. That's that's human resources. Um, that's that's staff and volunteers. Fancy term for staff and volunteers. Um, this section is pretty short and it's also pretty self explanatory. Um, it, it asks you to fill in uh, the number of employees, both full-time and part-time, and also your volunteers. Your annual report, uh, your organisational report, or your PAYG uh, payment summaries uh, can help you answer this question. Uh, now, when you're working through this question, keep in mind that, that volunteers can be, can be regular. They can be people you see you know, every day, every week, or, or every month or irregular, they might be someone who's turned up to a, a big sort of volunteer event uh, once a year, for example. Um, now, it's also to, important to remember that volunteers can include any unpaid board or committee members as, as well. Uh, a new question in this section uh, this year asks you how many 
uh, full-time equivalent or FTE staff worked for your charity during the last pay period of the 2017 reporting period. Uh, this figure is the number of full-time employees that your charity would have if it combined the hours of full-time, part-time and casual employees. So that one, uh, sorry to jump in there, Chris. Mm. So if a charity has a few full-time employees, they've got a few part-time that are on regular hours, and then they've got, they've got a few casuals that do sporadic hours, but yeah. th those hours are uh, recorded nonetheless. The full-time equivalent would just be the, the amount of hours that all of those put together adds up to. Yes, yeah. Um, if you're, if you're say, full-time uh, staff might be 35 hours, it might be 38 hours. Um, what we have on online, what we have through the, the AIS form, we have a, a calculator um, which, will, which will help you add, add these figures up. Um, you'll be able to work out or, or enter into the calculator uh, how many staff you've got working on a normal full-time basis, which again might be 35 or 38 hours. And then what you'll be able to do is add up the hours of your part-time and your casual staff, uh, work them out to what they would be if they were equi full-time equivalent, which is 35 or 38 hours, and it will come up with a figure that you can then en enter into your AIS, uh, and that will be what we will call the full-time equivalent okay. um, figure. That's uh, The calculator is linked directly uh, from the form, which is great. Um, so you can get on there and you can add it up, get back into the form, put the figures in. It is also linked directly from the, uh, the guide, the AIS guide as well. Um, now, the other thing, or there's two other things that, that we need to be aware of here. The uh, When you're doing your FTE figure, don't include volunteer numbers. Um, that's been something that we've gotten a little bit of feedback from people uh, have put in uh, their or included their volunteer numbers in their FTE numbers. We're only after um, staff, not volunteers. Uh, the volunteer numbers you can enter into uh, a question just previous to the FTE question. Uh, and the last thing, look, when you're doing these figures, we will accept your best estimate. Um, in case you're not 100% sure of, of exact numbers. If you've got exact numbers, great. Uh, if you can go through, add them up and work it out, great. If not, and you can give us a, a pretty decent estimate, that's fine as well. And that would be most likely the case for charities that have um, char um, sorry, casual staff on yeah. irregular hours and it's hard to, to um, sum it up in a, in a nice figure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Best estimate in those, in those cases. Yeah. Um, okay, let's have a look at um, section D, um, which is the finances, but um, it's important to keep in mind that um, we've come across instances of um, errors in reporting financial figures in previous years. So this is a section that it's um, worth doing slowly, very carefully and making sure that you're getting everything correct. Um, having a, have a look at the document that we mentioned at the beginning that's also listed here called the Avoiding Mistakes Guide, I guess we'll call it. The link there is acnc.gov.au forward slash 2017 AIS Avoid Mistakes, that's all as one word. <laughs> and that'll help you, um, well, as it suggests, avoid yes. mistakes. Um, just ways to prevent some of the more commonly made errors in this section are listed on the slides you can see on your screen. A lot of it's about just being well prepared and having the documents and information you need to before you start the section. And just double checking to ensure that you haven't made any typos or errors. Believe it or not, when keying in some figures, that, that has resulted in significant errors for charities, which um, the, well, the knock-on effect of which is that they have to then redo, correct their errors and resubmit their AIS at a later date. Um, so just get it right at the beginning. You'll avoid lots of trouble later on. Double check, triple check all your um, all your figures. Just the third point here that we've got um, is know if your charity is confirmed as a basic religious charity. This is a particular type of charity that um, the ACNC, it's like a charity category that the ACNC has. It's not just... Um, a basic description of charities that are mm. both religious and fairly simple and basic. It is a particular category that has several criteria that it, the organisation must meet to be confirmed as 
what we've called a basic religious charity. That's important because it affects um, the sorts of details and the information that you need to provide in your annual information statement. And what we found in the past is that some charities that are religious charities have misunderstood the term as to be just a generic descriptor and thought, well, yeah, I'm religious and I'm pretty basic. We're just a church, <laughs> so I'm a basic religious charity. That's not the case. Then they've mistakenly identified themselves as a basic religious charity. Just really keep this in mind. Basic religious charity is a particular type of category that is based on several criteria and the organisation to be confirmed as such needs to meet all of those criteria. You can read about that on our website. We'll provide a link for that um, later on and in the follow-up email that, that comes following the webinar. Yep. And finally, remember to submit the charity's financial report, including the financial statements for medium and large charities. Um, some charities, believe it or not, have um, uh, forgot to do that. And ensure you hit the attach button. That's one um, simple thing you can do. Hit and attach. All right. Now, um we're looking here, we've got uh, some of the cutoffs for uh, the small, medium and large. Um, we mentioned these earlier on. Um, the, the small uh, charities cut off, um, as you can see, annual revenue of less than 250 grand, uh, medium uh, 250,000 or more, but less than a million and large, um, the annual revenue is a, is a million uh, dollars or more. Um, now questions in Section D in the finance section, they vary depending on the charity size. Um, obviously, there's some additional information required from medium and large charities, which we will which we will go through. Um, so, it's important that you get your charity size right uh, back in section A when we ask you, because when you enter that size. Your questions in section D will vary depending on what size you are, small, medium, or large. As we said, um, ACNC basis charity size on annual revenue. Um, now, as you can see on this slide, there's a quick definition of revenue. It's important your charity knows the difference between revenue and income, uh, so it gets things right. Uh, revenue is usually shown as one of the top line items in an income or, or profit or loss statement. Uh, it can be made up of things like grants or donations, bequests, sales of goods, you know, interests, fees uh, for service provision, that sort of thing. Um, well, if you have any specific questions about charity size and revenue, uh, you can call us on 132262 or email advice at acnc.gov.au and we can go through and answer your, your specific questions or, or those questions that are, are specific to your, to your charity. Um, now we'll look at the look at the next one. There we go. Whoa. Now, as we mentioned, there's a number of requirements for medium and large charities when it comes to Section D and financial reporting. Uh, one thing that medium and large charities need to do, which small charities don't have to, um, they have to submit an annual financial report alongside their annual information statement. Submitting an annual financial report is mandatory for medium and large charities and optional for small ones. What the annual financial report has to include is listed there on the slide. Uh, these requirements are for charities with no transitional reporting requirements. If you have transitional reporting requirements, again, could be a good idea to give us a call, work through if you have any queries uh, with, our, with our lovely people in advice. Um, Medium-sized charities have the option of submitting a reviewer's report or auditor's report. Large charities must submit an auditor's report. The annual information statement form will request you upload your financial report as an attachment. Um, to do so, you'll reach a certain point in the form. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's a basic attach and, and um, upload and attach sort of thing. You click the attach button. Um, after you've uploaded your, your document, please click attach because if you don't, the uploaded document won't attach and we won't get it. Um, so just do that. Make sure the, the document that you have uploaded uh, attaches. Um, and also, as you work through Section D, it's probably a good idea to save um, save your, your work, uh, perhaps even after every section, but particularly Section D because there's obviously some figures that have to be uh, put in, some uh, stuff that needs to be uploaded. So that would probably be the best way to go.
there's some guidance on the website to help you through this section, particularly with some of the definitions and things that make up revenue and, and types of accounting and that sort of thing. We understand that many people that work um, in charities may not um, may not deal with this um, in their uh, regular jobs. It might be something that they're doing on the side or, or out of out of business hours on the weekend and, and may not have um, all the knowledge um, all ready to go. So the guides are here to help you get through them if that's the case. Um, some a rundown on cash and accrual accounting on our website. Again, we'll keep all of, we'll put all of these links in the follow up email that comes. So um, don't feel the need to scribble them all down now. It's just uh, more to highlight that there are these resources on the ACNC website to help you through each section of the financial part of the annual information statement. And of course, as Chris mentioned, if there's a particular tricky thing that's specific to your organisation something about your revenue or your income, please give us a call. We'll be able to provide much more detailed, specific guidance and answers for you if you give us a call and, and um, let us know the details of your organisation. All right. Now we've gotten through the financial section, which is wonderful. So we're sort of on the homeward stretch. Um, there's a couple of new parts of the annual information statement, which we'll cover as part of our remaining slides. Uh, one of those uh, sections is, is uh, section E. Now that looks at uh, your annual report. It, it allows charities to upload their annual report or share a, a web link uh, to it. So that can be displayed on um, that charity's entry uh, on the charity register. Now, having your annual report on the register it's a great way for for yourselves your charity to showcase the work uh, you do to uh, existing or potential donors to supporters to funders uh, to the wider community um, it increases charity transparency as well which is which is important if you want to upload a copy of your annual report just choose the file when you're prompted in in section e um, find the document you wish to upload. It might be on your desktop, it might be in your, your files, in your documents, that sort of thing. Hit the attach button uh, once you've uploaded it. Again, please hit the attach button. At this point, um, the document will attach. It doesn't happen instantaneously. So just wait for a short time to ensure the document uploads and attaches. Uh, now, if your annual report is already online, it might be uh, as it is quite commonly part of your charity's website, for example. Um, your charity can just supply a web address which links to the document. So that's the other option. You can either upload and attach a document or you can just give us a, a web link uh, and either way we'll be able to access your, your annual report there. Other part of uh, this slide uh, that we will cover is Section G, that's Other Obligations. Um, now, it contains questions about certain details the ACNC holds uh, and that's just to make sure they're up to date and they're accurate. So this year, charities have the ability to update their list of responsible persons directly through their annual information statement, which is very handy. If your responsible persons have changed positions within your organisation or they might have left or new ones have arrived, all these changes can be easily outlined through the annual information statement. Just before we move on there, Chris, a responsible person, again, maybe for the people that are doing this for the first time or are new to a charity and new to the ACNC, um, what is a responsible person? Uh, pretty basically speaking, it's a board or, or a committee member. Yep. Um, someone who uh, has, as the name suggests, a level of responsibility for your charity's direction okay. uh, for its operation and, and that sort of thing. So, so not necessarily all, all the staff or the mm. people that you hire at the charity that you consider are responsible. Yes. It's, not, it's not, again, a, a generic description of someone who's a good person and very responsible. It's a, a specific designation of the people responsible for the direction of the charity, the decisions yeah. of the charity. Yeah. So a board or a committee. committee. Yeah. yeah, a team of management, That's okay. that sort of stuff, yeah. Right. Now, with your responsible persons, um, when your charity gets to this part of the form, there's a there's a list or a little table there. You can see a screenshot up on, up on your screen. Um, what, what you'll be requested uh, to do is if any responsible persons have left your charity or changed roles, 
uh, you can edit or remove their details by clicking on the uh, remove or edit uh, option in the first table. Uh, to add a responsible person, go to the second table and click on the add new record option. Um, there's a little pop out screen that will appear that will ask you for that re new responsible person's details. Um, so fill that in, save, uh, and, and they, uh, the details will be updated. Now, Section G also uh, reminds charities to update their governing documents or their charity subtypes. Uh, now, governing document is the document that uh, I guess provides the direction uh, for your uh, charity's operation. It's often called a a deed or what are some of the other names? Constitution, constitution, yeah. Rules of association, that maybe that sort of stuff. Yeah, many many um, organisations have uh, say model rules if they're an incorporated association. Yeah, yeah, just the document that sets out the rules and the processes by which the organisation has to operate. Yeah. Now, when this all this updating what its main aim is to, I guess, ensure the information that we have is, is accurate and up-to-date. Uh, it also ensures your charity complies with its obligation uh, to notify, notify us of any changes uh, to your details as, as well. All right. Um, the, the sharp-eyed lot of you will have noticed we skipped F in there. We went from E to G. We're back to F now. Um, as the title suggested, asks about state and territories. It's a new section for the 2017 Annual Information Statement. We previously didn't have this part. Um, it'll just help the ACNC work with state and territory regulators to streamline reporting requirements, as Chris mentioned earlier in the webinar. That's one of the aims. And the more information we have about the reporting required of charities by other government bodies, particularly at the state and territory level, will help the ACNC um, work towards streamlining that reporting and, and uh, you know, reduce the instances of, of um, duplicated reporting where charities may have to submit the same thing multiple times to multiple regulators. Of course, that's the sort of thing we want to want to clean up and, and, and streamline. The questions um, are for charities which are incorporated associations or for those that intend to fundraise in the 2018 reporting period. Um, I, a lot of organisations, a lot of charities are incorporated associations, so it's likely to apply to to um, them. Just uh, it's worth having a think about your own charity's uh, structure. If, you, if you're unsure, um, ask around, see if you can figure out what structure your organisation takes. It might be an incorporated association. And also importantly, for those that aren't but intend to fundraise in 2018, which I imagine would be a fairly common yes. occurrence, um, this question um, is required as well. So the the first question uh, refers, as, as Matt said, specifically to uh, incorporated, uh, I guess, incorporated associations. Important point to note here is that um, the question is for charities incorporated with their state or territory and which report to a state or territory regulator. Now, that might be Office of Fair Trading, for example, uh, Consumer Affairs, uh, Consumer Protection Body, that sort of thing. Um, now, if your charity falls under that sort of heading, um, simply answer yes to the question. Uh, otherwise, you simply select no. If you select yes, uh, the form will refresh. There'll be a bit of a pause. You'll see the loading screen come up um, and you'll be asked for a little bit more information and that information will be directly related to the state or territory you are incorporated in uh, and you'll be most likely asked for your incorporated association number. Um, now, depending on what state or territory you are incorporated with, you might also be asked questions as a, as a bit of a follow-up. Uh, now, one of them might be that your the date of your charity's annual general meeting. Uh, there's another one, I think, that asks about uh, the number of uh, members or board members as, as well. It just depends on what um, state or territory you're in. So just have a careful read through as, as you work through that, that section and make sure you're answering the, the right questions. Um, the second question in this section, again, it, it looks at fundraising. Um, you'll be asked if you intend to fundraise during the reporting period. Uh, simple, again, yes or no question. Um, if you answer yes, again, more questions will appear. They will ask you uh, which states or territories you'll be fundraising in. And if you hold a fundraising license, 
you'll be uh, asked to enter it next to the relevant states or territories in which you hold it. Again, good spot here to save your progress, double check it, make sure it's all good, and then move on again. So if you are an incorporated association, having these sorts of details handy will help you through this section, some of the, the, the numbers and, and, and whatnot. Rule of thumb, I guess if you know that you report to something like Office of Fair Trading or I think Consumer Business Affairs in some states, um, different names in different states, but if you know you report to a state body like that, it's highly likely that yes. you're an incorporated association if yeah. you're unsure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, we've already, oh, there we go. There oh, we sorry. go. We forgot to give you the, <laughs> to get the screenshot to but help that, you through that, but that's what it would look yeah. like. So they're, they're the questions that will, will pop up we did this one. We did say that was simple, so there you go. And, and also, again, you've got that help text there, which will help you, uh, you work through those questions as well. Okay. Ancillary funds. Um, now, I'll, I'll, um, I'll sort of say right now that, that ancillary funds is um, something that most of you probably won't have to deal with. Um, it's, as it says here, Section AF, um, it's not applicable for the vast majority of charities um, who, are, who are completing the annual information statement. If you do need to fill in this section, again, our guide has got plenty of support to help you out. Um, and just to note here too, um, as it says there on the slide, completing this section of the AIS, it replaces the requirement to lodge a separate ATO uh, ancillary fund return for 2017. Um, any information that you, that you give us in this section, uh, it won't be published at all. What will happen to it is it'll only be forwarded on to the ATO just so they have those records. Um, and again, it's, it's an endeavour to try and streamline uh, reporting and to cut down duplicate uh, reporting as well. This section won't even pop up if you're not an ancillary fund. That's so correct, yeah. if if most of these words just mean nothing to you, <laughs> it's likely that you're not an ancillary fund and you won't have to worry anyway. Yes. But if you are working for an ancillary fund or you've got responsibility for an ancillary fund, many of these words will probably make perfect sense and you'll know what we're talking about. <laughs> That's probably where the distinction lies um, on this section. Indeed. Last one, declaration and form preview. Tick the declaration box. It asks you that the information you provided is true and correct. We've um, really reiterated the importance of double checking to make sure that everything is correct throughout, so do that. Um, you can preview the form as well. You just click preview submission when you do and um, you'll receive a draft copy which you can have a look over before you click submit. So if you do need to get someone else to have a look at it, you need the, the chief financial officer or the, the board or whoever it is to give approval, that's the way you can do that. Unless you want everyone to just come and crowd around your computer and preview Indeed. it on the screen, you can do that yes. too. But this is a more practical solution, I think. You can preview it on screen. You can also print out the um, the preview as well, which is, which is, there you go, best of both worlds. Yep. So, yeah. Um, and... Uh, We've had a number of charities in the past that have completed their form, as in they've answered all the questions that they need to answer, but they um, they didn't click submit at the end. And then it, on our end, it looks like they haven't submitted their annual information statement, of course, and then once it passes the due date and they're, they're late by more than six months, we notify them. They're shocked because they thought they did it before the deadline. It turns out it was as simple as not hitting submit. So, as yeah, as silly as that may sound to, to highlight here, it, it's happened and we've learned from it. So it's something that we want to reiterate. Just click submit. <laughs> it's probably the easiest thing you'll have to do in the whole form. It's not mm -hmm. worth being late and missing deadlines for, for something so silly. So let's make sure we all <laughs> hit submit. And that will be it. You'll get a confirmation that um, we've received the AIS and um, it should then be, the information should be published on the, the charity's page on the charity register following the submission. Now, we've gone through the form and we also probably have to go through what happens if you don't do the right thing and don't submit your, your annual information statement. Um, this slide here provides a bit of a rundown on that. Uh, there are consequences. There's no two ways about it. Um, this is this is something you, you, uh, charities need to do. So uh, we'd rather not have to mention these, but we still do have charities that don't do the right thing 
uh, don't fulfill their reporting requirements. Um, so there's a number of actions the AC, ACNC can take if charities don't do the right thing. They range from statements and, uh, and red marks on the organisation's charity register listing, which uh, don't look good. Uh, they make it clear to the public that the charity isn't up to date with its reporting. Um, they can go further than that. There can be penalty notices uh, and there's the possibility of a charity losing its registration. If a charity doesn't submit its annual information statement for two years, it becomes what we call a, a double defaulter. Uh, and you may have seen that term used around the website uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, when that occurs, we will look to revoke a charity's registration. Uh, and that means it loses its eligibility for tax deductions and the like. Uh, and also, if it's just through a simple mistake, it's a bit of a hassle getting uh, re-registered as well. So we'll do the right thing. Um, please submit your annual information statement. Um, there's more details on the link there. You can see at the bottom of the slide about what happens if you don't do the right thing. Um, but yeah, just yeah, do the right thing. That would be the easiest yeah. way to go. It's worth reiterating, reiterating the effect that such a statement, such a red notice has on the um, reputation of a charity in the public mind. It's um, The charity register is viewed by um, quite a number of people to look up charities to see if they're registered to find out details about charities and to see a big red symbol to um, let the public know that the charity doesn't complete its reporting requirements um, really has a damaging effect on the charity's reputation. And the charity's reputation is, is really important. It can often take decades to build and, and the trust that comes with that but it's so easily it's so fragile and it's so easily broken so you wouldn't want to allow something as simple as not completing the annual information statement um, on time affect a charity's reputation in that way okay and that's it for the formal presentation there is more information on the website we've we've really thrown a lot of links at you today so i, I wouldn't expect you to have to write down all of these. We will include all of them in an email that is sent to you as attendees in the next couple of days. So write down the ones you need to, but don't worry if you don't if you can't do so, you will get an email with all of these links. Importantly, the guide and the checklist and the avoid mistakes are, are really handy to help you get through the AIS. Um, stay in touch with us. We've got lots of web guidance, video content and, and webinars such as these throughout the year. If you need help with your organisation in particular, um, whatever it may be, give us a call on 132262. That's 13 ACNC if you need a, a short way or an easy way to remember the phone number. Um, happy to help you with anything. Or send us an email, advice at acnc.gov.au for stuff about your charity, your organisation. You can get email updates and newsletters as well from us. And we have a series of podcasts and we are um, fairly active on social media as well. Um, thank you. A different email address is here, and that one's for feedback in particular about the webinars. So if you have any comments or questions or feedback that you would like to um, give us, then please do so at education.acnc.gov.au. Don't send questions about your charity's um, operations or, or whatever it may be, finances and filling out the AS to this email address. They're the questions that go to advice at acnc.gov.au. Education at acnc.gov.au is for your questions, comments, and feedback regarding the education aspect of things, such as webinars. Um, we've got some time for some questions now. Um, so let's have a look at what we've got. Um, Chris, we did mention earlier on that, well, really early on, the first section of the AIS, there was um, a mention of confirming the details are correct, including the address for service. Uh, someone's just asked about this address for service. Um, basically, what it is in particular, is there a particular um, address that needs to be provided there, whether that be the post office address or the business address or the email address or, or whatever it may be? Generally speaking, the um, the address for service, um, look, we, we look at it in, in this context. It's the address, and it's often an email address, um, that... Is, uh, that is used for, by us to communicate directly with, um, with the charity. That's to direct all our correspondence. Um, 
Now, it may might not sound uh, massively important, but it is because obviously we need to get in touch with charities, um, need to tell them, for example, that they need to submit their annual information statement. Um, but there's also obviously other messages and other bits and pieces that occur during the year that we need to get in touch with them uh, with. So question four, which, which does ask for you not only to enter your um, address for service, but to confirm it as well. Um, very important, double check it. That address should be a, a general email address, one that perhaps is a, an email address for your charity rather than um, Joe Blogs at my charity, you know, dot com dot au or something like that. Um, because what can happen is if your responsible persons change, um, the ability for you to be able to access that email address might, you know, might end, uh, and that means that your address for service. You can't get, you can't access it. You can't get the information you need from us, and and we can't get in touch with you. And that unfortunately can lead to issues in in terms of, uh, you know, us not being able to get in touch, pass on messages, communicate that you need to submit documents, and and that sort of thing. So make sure you've got that that question right. Um, importantly, it can be an email address. I hope that comes through in the answer too. That it doesn't have to be um, a physical address, and in many cases. An email address is the most practical for an organisation because if they need to re receive a reminder, a notification or something, an email address is the um, means by which they want to receive it. And if there is an email address listed as the address for service for the charity, that's the first point um, of call for us. We will send an email rather than posting a letter or anything like that. So if you've got an email address, please put it in there. And I think that's why it's important to keep it up to date. Um, people don't Oh, charities don't often move physical addresses. They're in a single location for a long time, but email addresses come and go. And um, uh, many charities have missed notifications, important notifications, um, simply because they didn't think of their address for service as being an email address and didn't think to check that the, the correct email address was being used as the ACNC's address for service. Okay, um, we've got another question about finances. Someone was not quite sure who, well, who, which charities were required to submit um, financial information. Um, it might be worth just uh, going over that once more. So there are three sizes. Um, there are small charities, medium charities, and large charities. Uh, Chris, what are the, the boundaries that separate those tiers? Um, now, small charities, we look at total revenue. So revenue is the the factor here. Um, small charities uh, total sort of annual revenue of under two hundred and fifty thousand. Medium uh, is two hundred and fifty thousand, but not quite to under a, a million. So that's um, to nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. Lots of nines. <laughs> um, and large charities are a million dollars or more in revenue. Um, so they're the three main boundaries. Again. You answering or charities answering that question in the first section will impact on the questions they are asked in section D, the financial section. So double, triple check that you've got that that right. Um, and then which ones are supposed or which ones have to submit a financial um, statement in the financial section of the AIS? The Small charities don't have to. Okay. They can. Um, we welcome it. It, it. It's it's great, but it's we encourage it. Yeah, yeah it's it's optional. Uh, for them, medium and large charities. Yeah, we we ask um, that they submit a financial financial statement, and the requirements for those financial statements differ slightly between medium and large um, charities. Um, medium charities can uh, work through a reviewer's report or an auditor's report. Um, large charities have to submit an auditor's report as part of their their documents. So, um, again, just be aware of of what your what's your size is, but also what the requirements are. And again, um, there's plenty of of guidance on the website, both through the AIS guidance, but generally uh, generally on the site as well. Okay. So, um, well, the short answer: if you're a large charity, you must submit an audited financial report. Medium charity, you have a choice, reviewed or audited report. Small charities don't have to, but we encourage it. And it's a good um, uh, nod to transparency yeah. and accountability to do so. Okay. Um, the address, sorry, I'm going to answer that question. The address first, not the address first. The um, uh, due dates for uh, filling in the annual information statement. 
someone's just asked, um, they're, they're a little bit confused. Can we go over that once more? So the um, we might actually bring up the slide. Go to the slide. There, um, is it. there it is. Okay. It might come across as a little bit confusing here. So um, probably the culprit is this phrase reporting period. Think about the 12 month period to which the charity reports or keeps records of its, its, its finances and activities and whatnot. For many charities, this is going to be like businesses and individuals that have to do the tax return. It's going to be the financial year, which is in Australia, 1st of July through to the 30th of June. For other charities, a large chunk of charities have a calendar year reporting period. So they keep all their, their finance activities, their books to the January to December calendar year. Um, they're the most common. Of course, you can have any 12-month yeah, um, yes, yeah. period you like. So it, yours may begin on the 1st of April or the 1st of May or whatever it may be. The due date for all charities will differ, but the consistent point is that it's six months following the end of the charity's um, unique reporting period. The timing of this webinar is probably most um, pertinent for those that report on a regular financial year end because their financial year uh, finished in June, end of June. Six months following that is the end, is the due date for the annual information statement. But as Chris mentioned, we have given a one month extension, bringing that 31st of December deadline up to 31st of January for this lot only. Otherwise, the regular six month period is the, um, or the six month following the end of the reporting period is the is the due date for other charities. I hope that clears that up. But of course, if you have any more questions about your charity's particular circumstances, please send us an email advice at acnc.gov.au or give us a call 132262 and we'll happily um, answer what you need to. Um, okay, well that takes us through to um, the end of the webinar today. Sorry, I'm skipping through the slides so you can get back to our um, contact details and whatnot. <laughs> um, when we end the webinar, there will be a very, very short survey. I think it is only three questions. Um, we appreciate it if you answer. You, you don't have to, it's not compulsory, but um, we do get a lot out of those feedback surveys at the end and we'd appreciate it if you took the time, which my guess is probably 20 seconds, if that, to answer it. Um, we'll get a lot out of it. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. We really appreciate your attendance. If we didn't get around to your question, we apologize. We will endeavor to do so via email. If there's anything you need to call us, call and ask us about, please do so at 132262. And we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. See thanks. you next time. See you later.